as is hello and welcome to my youtube channel how are you doing today i'm not bad how are you james you okay yeah brilliant yeah life is good it's, it's good really man. exciting to have a former stone rose on my channel i don't know i gotta stand back every time somebody says former stone rose or ex stone roses or something it's like yeah no and <laughs> yeah no i'm not yeah. sure but yeah you're right you're right obviously john squire left the roses in early 96 and you came on board as his replacement. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the story, about how you came to be, I can't imagine a more pressurised position, John Squire's replacement? You know, ignorance is bliss. Uh, I was oblivious to the facts. The aura and the awe of, in which people held John, which, uh, you know, I understand absolutely, you know, um, an absolute talent and legend. I mean, how it came about was through uh, Robbie J. Maddox, the, the drummer, who was an old friend of mine, they wanted to demo new songs. And they did tell me that um, they couldn't find John, I couldn't get older John. So they wanted to demo these songs and they wanted me to play guitar. So I just said, yeah, absolutely, I'll help you. So I did these early demos, you know, songs like Black Sheep and, uh, and Getting High and Ice Cold Cube, that was another. So I, I just um, stepped in really to help with his songwriting. That's why my guitar's on those recordings, those early ones. And then it was afterwards when the proverbial hit the fan. I think they were hurting really, you know, <laughs> they wanted to get back at John maybe, or maybe it was just anger or whatever it was they were thinking about like even you know slash <laughs> came into the picture and i think manny said to me you know he said yeah but i ain't playing with the guy who wears leather pants and then for some reason or other they didn't go with that and from atlanta georgia to longside manchester he had to be a boy from longside manchester didn't it and that was that i was in and then that was that <laughs> we were finished <laughs> It was longer the process of going, getting in than it was getting out because, uh, you know, it kind of imploded very quickly. What about the style? I know, I, mean, look, I assume what you're going to play tonight is a sort of standard Stone Roses set, but maybe I'm wrong. But after that, what do you think is going to happen with the Z's? Because, you know, you're new, you're different, you're not John Squire. You're going to grow and bloom like a rose. As Angel stamp his authority on it, you know, he's got to get it and make it his own now, hasn't he? And uh, make it his own, he will, because I've heard him and you haven't. And I know, and you don't. <laughs> Well, you obviously joined the Roses after Rennie had left because it was Robbie Maddox who invited you in, you mentioned. Did you ever get the chance to meet the great Rennie? I met Rennie, well, it was at his house, actually. Ian had kind of introduced me. I just dropped by and said hello, and he invited me in for a jam. We went in and I had a jam, just played. That was it. He had his drum kit set up in his garage. I brought a guitar with me and we just played. <laughs> An incredible drummer, fantastic musician. Uh, we never worked together. Apart from, I used some, um, Ian had given me some uh, drum loops from uh, some sessions of some old record, Rose's recordings, and I'd used Rennie's drums for a track called Mummy's Boy, which is on my solo album, Law to Longside. And so I used a Rennie breakbeat on this particular track, but we never worked together per se. Um, but we had a jam session once and I met him a couple of times after that. But really it was all, a, you know, Ian and Manny, you know, uh, I'd never met John and still haven't. Um, with Ian and Manny, we just grew to be friends. Are there any stories from your time with the Roses in the 90s um, that have not yet seen the light of day? Are there any anecdotes you could share with us that haven't been heard before? Yes, well... 
I, I don't know. I, I kind of, if I wrote an autobiography, it's a kind of a, I'd have to leave the country. <laughs> the fans of the bands that I've been in are everywhere. And I think some things just need to stay untold. Or the bands, I was in Asia before I was in Simply Red. I was in the rock group Asia. Uh, I remember going to um, <laughs> a, a recording session down in London and I said, am I getting a hotel? Because my fiance is coming down and she's, you know, kind of very strict Muslim, blah, 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 <laughs> you know, veiled up and the whole, the whole thing. <laughs> and they said, yeah, yeah, Jeff, Jeff Downs' girlfriend's going to put you up in his, her place. They gave me an address. I turned up at this address with my fiance in the taxi. They gave me the address. So I don't really know. And it says Soho. I got to Soho knock on this door i walk in the place it's a brothel for fuck's sake the guy's put me in a brothel uh, or she has and you go up this spiral staircase and it's like um you know and each door you pass it says the you know, nubian princess <laughs> you know 36 double d knock on three times or whatever and then you're up the next door and it says swedish twins or blondes <laughs> and we, we got these stairs and i'm looking at my fiance and she's looking at me through this you know all you can see is her eyes <laughs> like and i can hear her breath saying you wait until I tell my brothers <laughs> we get to this room and it's like an empty room with a four a double bed and that's it and some naughty pictures on the on the walls and <laughs> and that's wow. it we're in so I should have guessed as soon as we got there you know I've, I've been in situations where I've been sat in nightclubs in I can't remember it was in Australia or Japan or somewhere and I've got I've had a, a a blonde sat on one leg and one on the other trying to force a bottle of champagne down my throat and i'm like no i'm a good muslim i'm a good muslim boy and i've got a blonde sat on each leg i never told them to sit on my legs they just came and plonked themselves there and they're trying to put force this bottle of champagne on me which i'm going no no there could be a whole book of that like you know how does a muslim cope with <laughs> the pressures of rock and roll that on the road would be fascinating <laughs> Yeah. These things have, have happened and they were the wildest situations to ever be in. And, you know, just like being in a Rosing and carrying a £150,000 guitar in a beat-up old case around the streets around here. And that was like being in the coolest band in the world, having to play some of the coolest guitar parts in the world, um, handed the coolest instruments in the world, um, the way that other groups looked at you. And if if they're watching this, you know it. When the roses walked in a tent, the silence that occurred <laughs> was like, I mean, you've got to look at me as like, not as a member of the Stone Roses, but as an inside sober observer. That's who I am. And seeing the reactions of other bands and walking in, you know, like Reading, for instance, and walked in a tent and everybody just shut up. Hey, because the roses are here. And I'm saying that not as the as the superstar, but as, like I said, somebody who just had the honour and the privilege of being in the band, uh, or being asked to be in the band and enjoy this journey of private planes and throwing butties around on a on an aircraft and making a right mess and pulling down oxygen masks to kind of go, oh, what's it like and can you turn it on and <laughs> whatever. You mentioned Reading. Now, obviously, that gig has gone down in legend. The band seemed really tight. Ian seemed like he was kind of slightly on another planet for that gig. What's your memories of, of Reading? Well, you know what? The answer to that question is you don't need to know my memories. You don't need to listen to it. You just need to watch the video. So I just want to get a general feel of how, how you guys feel today, sort of with this new man in your midst. How would you feel playing in front of 60 to 80,000 people and want a chance to show off for an hour and a half? Nice, isn't it? Sure. How do you feel, Lindsay? Are you nervous, excited? Uh, I'm excited, I'm not nervous. I'm just uh, stopping my mum's watching that. That's what I do it for. So I can go, hey mum, dad, you watching this? That's about it. You will just see a sea of, I don't know how many were there, 80,000, 90,000, 100 and some of the thousand. A sea of people jumping up and down, right? So those mofos, you know, who wrote those articles, I don't know what happened in your lives. You got bullied at school, 
But that negativity, yeah, of course things went wrong. But you tell me when Ian always sang perfectly. He had bad days. You listen to recordings of The Roses and I'd laugh my socks off if you t told me otherwise. He has issues sometimes just because of technical things on stage, monitoring and things like he can't hear himself and then he goes off tune because he just can't hear himself. He's had a bad night <laughs> or he's stayed up all night and it'll affect his performance in the day. That doesn't make him a bad musician. It just makes him an art, a rock and roll artist. That's what they do. They do what the they want. The band had evolved to a different sound and that's the sound that Ian and Manny wanted or maybe Ian, Manny and Robbie wanted. I don't know. I came in the last so I was merely kind of going off what people were saying they wanted and when they were happy that's what I was playing. What is your style that is obviously the same or different from John? What is it? Uh, my style. Bruce Lee, 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 the Asian, no, yeah, the Asian. Well, no. we, I mean, you look at the band. We could do anything <laughs> we wanted to do. If we wanted to make Mongolian sheep herders music, we could do that kind of stuff. The laptop just died, so I've gone to my phone. So, I mean, excuse me for having a rant about that, but, you know, I think sometimes you need a reality check. You need to get put things back in perspective that, yeah, it wasn't a, uh, a great night. It wasn't one of the best gigs ever. I just remember being on the stage, if you ask me about what I remember, and just seeing a, a sea of people enjoying themselves in front of that stage. You know, it was a great festival. Rage Against the Machine were on on another day. I was happy as Larry, <laughs> you know? And it wasn't all that the press wrote about it. So please don't jump on that bandwagon. Like you just said, actually, um, I wasn't there, and I just read the NME, Select and Q and, and the various magazines that yep. absolutely trounced it. But was the general vibe of the band when they came off stage that it had basically been a strong, successful gig and then the, then that the press effectively took the band down after that? Yeah, I mean, the press are hugely responsible. They always are. We did make mistakes and so on. I absolutely did. But, you know, that, that's the nature of bands, especially rock and roll bands. You look at Aerosmith and so on, you know, you look at what they were like on stage and the press didn't help. And not having the internet at that time didn't help. The press controlled things very much so. We hear that um, John Leckie's working with Mark Owen. Are you guys planning to uh, collaborate with the young man? Chip the girls with kids, no. <laughs> Which John? Which John? It's quiet. Someone won't talk to you, it's hard to know if you fall in love with him. How did you fall out with John Squire then? When did the problem start? The problem the started, fall out with problem John started when he phoned up and said, I'm leaving the band, otherwise I didn't know nothing about it. Yo, that had been planning <laughs> for one and a half, two, three years to, to uh, go away and do his Johnny Zeppelin's motorcade. Why do you think he wanted to leave the band all of a sudden? Because he felt his power threatened, because we was all getting a bit too good for him. He's a power, uh, power tripper. So you know what he's now he's away doing his own thing. Good luck to him, whatever he wants to do, but we've got the man of Z's now, and he's a much better man. What was his power then? His power was control thinking. No, we were too strong thing. for him, and we were too nice to him. That's what's happening. Why didn't he sack him and give him the problem? Good question. Something that we should have done. But well, because it gets so meek and quiet, I was there for him. Let him do this thing, let him get his heart system, that's what he wants to do. I'm with him, because we've got all the time in the world. Are any of you um, friends with John? No, not at all. I wouldn't even bother to phone me out if you heard my mum, dad, 
everybody who was at every lineage was killed in a little way crash. <laughs> because he can't be asked to get out of his bedroom. That's right. Yeah, but you know, he ended it. He became friends with a bug of cold cane. He put out before his friends. Reading was, uh, wow, an event to be at. <laughs> Bad, good, terrible, fantastic, whatever. All I know, I was on stage with Ian Brown and Manny and Robbie and, and Nigel, and, and, I, and I, I loved every second of it. So which of the Roses' second coming recordings of you know, demos, B-sides or anything, um, did your guitar playing make it onto with any? what I call the third coming. <laughs> I only revisited Ice Cold Q because it ended up on Ian Brown's first solo debut album. High Times, sorry, I said getting high before, but it was a song called High Times. And a song called Black Sheep, it was those three songs. But I'd given up my only copy, my cassette, of those songs to Ian. So that cassette is really valuable. But hey, you know, Unfinished Monkey Business was done on cassette tapes. It started in my you know, little place here in Longsight. Uh, I, d I recorded it on cassette tape. I mean, I re do a lot of recording at home. I did my solo album recording at home and then went st recording studios after. And, and I think about it, I remember Bonehead, Paul rang me, <laughs> as he does sometimes, at three o'clock in the morning, saying, this song is called The Other Side. <laughs> and I'm sure Paul wouldn't mind me telling you. But he <laughs> rings me at three in the morning and goes, have you heard this song? It's great. It's brilliant. And I'm like, yeah, Paul, I wrote it. And he goes, no, you've not listened to it. <laughs> he says, you've not listened to it, The Other Side. <laughs> He said, he's brilliant, mate. Have you really? <laughs> I said, yeah, I've listened to it a hundred times. I wrote it as I was... <laughs> and, I, and I love that about Paul, you know, about Bonehead. I'm not a big Oasis fan, but I respect that first album and that second album and that first album of that band context, as I do with The Roses before I was even in the band, of what a band really is and the chemistry of people involved the joy and the journey of that group of people. And that's what Oasis are to me. I remember watching you and Ian on top of the pops doing My Star. Um, I'll never forget it because everyone at school the next day was going, what was that dude at the back doing with the eggs? Millions love the Stone Roses and then they went and split up. Their guitarists went to form the Seahorses, but whatever happened to their indie god frontman? Well, he's back. He's here. My Star, Ian Brown. <laughs> well, quite simply, he was just messing with your minds. He was just messing with your heads. And that's it. We were throwing eggs around as well. I mean, Ian was throwing eggs in it. We were on the, on the big screen projector. And, uh, <laughs> and that's all it was. No rocket science to it, just messing around. <laughs> Rock and roll. All right, cool. At the BBC. Um, and so last of all, as is, where can people find you online? Where can they hear what you're doing now? Um, where are you on the socials? On majority of things, I'm at Aziz Ibrahim 56, Twitter and Instagram and uh, TikTok. So between Aziz Ibrahim Music and, and Aziz Ibrahim 56, I'm, uh, you know, on everything. You, you pick your poison. Mate, thank you so much for your time. It's been a privilege to talk to uh, one of the uh, actual ex-Stone Roses members. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> You're an oasis, Ed. But uh, thanks for having me. I hope uh, things uh, go well with the channel. You're doing really well. It looks great. I hope this contribution helps in some way.